in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. Three brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, John Flack, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to the show where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Russell Guest. Today, joining me is a familiar voice for the show, Chad Robinson. Chad, say hi to the people. Hi, everybody. Uh, the people say hi back. And to with us, Chad, do you have any idea how excited I am today? I've heard you're very excited. I'm, I'm level 11 excited. See, most people's excitement only goes to 10, but mine's at 11 because we've got a great guest today. And today we have Ernest Bellamy from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my co-worker at AE7. Ernest, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a great day to be here on the famed Retro Movie Roundtable. So, uh, it's great to have you in, and we wanted to get to know you a little bit. We're going to hit you with some deep, intensive personal questions. Do you think you can handle that? I'll try my best. Okay. So, uh, today we're going to look at a movie that's a Miami movie. You're a Miami guy. You grew up in Miami. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Born and raised. Tell the people who haven't been to Miami or don't know much about Miami, if they're going to Miami for the first time, what's the best part about Miami? Uh, I would have to say always the weather, with the rare exception of when a hurricane comes through. After that, hey, it's great. Good, except for the hurricanes. Food good? Food is great. Uh, you cannot uh, beat the collection and um, ensemble of cultural variety, deliciousness that is everything that's in Miami. So uh, I brought in other people who I've worked with in the past. Usually they're architects, but I should mention Ernest is not just an architect, but you are also an urban designer. Correct. And tell the people at home what that is. Uh, the way I like to simply explain it is um, as uh, architects work uh, on the building, interior designers, they work inside the building, and urban designers work in between buildings. So that, that middle ground in between buildings those relationships of what happens uh, between the buildings where people gather and interact, that's, that's the, the realm that I play in. Awesome. And that's a, so that's a new perspective for the show, and we're excited to see what you find in between the moments of the movies. So, uh, you mentioned before that uh, you're excited about the, uh, the Black Bottom Film Festival here in Pittsburgh? Correct. Why don't you uh, tell people what that is? Uh, well, uh, wherever I go, whether whatever city that I, I locate in, I, I really enjoy going to film festivals. Uh, here in Pittsburgh, uh, one that's really caught my eye is the Black Bottom Film Festival. It's uh, a film festival catered towards uh, African American films. Uh, it's showing right now, um, this week in Pittsburgh at the Row House Cinema, uh, for half of the engagement. And then uh, towards the latter part of this week, uh, for the weekend run, there's going to be films shown at the August Wilson Center downtown. Have you attended this event before? Uh, not in Pittsburgh. So this is my first year attending. Uh, but it's a great way to see not only uh, films from uh, local artists, uh, but prominent national films and international films as well. It sounds cool. Sounds cool. And Row House Theater, it, you know, it, we haven't really talked about it before, but it is so up our alley here at Retro Movie Roundtable. It's a cool theater. It's in downtown Lawrenceville in Pittsburgh, which is a really trendy neighborhood that's been revitalized. And uh, it's an old movie theater, uh, and they show retro movies and uh, also films of uh, from not necessarily always art films, but uh, they, they do a really cool job to give light to films that aren't necessarily going to hit the movie theater. This is not like necessarily a plug, they're not paying us. It's genuinely a cool place, so definitely check that out in the August Wilson Center as well. We're about to do a detective movie, and I know that you mentioned that you love mystery movies yourself. 
What is your favorite mystery movie, would you say? Mm. Uh, I would say right now, um, one that came out a few years ago is Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. It is really good. Yeah. This is one with Rooney Mara and Daniel Craig, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I'm haunted by the fact that we didn't get the other two movies out of this trilogy of books. <laughs> yeah. They took too long to come out. and I, I know. It's unfortunate. Daniel Craig wanted too much money, I think, and it just, like you said, it got tied up with production stuff and rights to the book. The author died, unfortunately. All sad stuff, so we got to wait a long time for them to come back and do it. And recently, they I saw The Girl in the Spider's Web. Yep. This movie is written by another author. Uh, sorry, the book's written by another author, and so this movie was made as well. Did you see that? I did not. I did, and I have to say huge disappointment in compared to dragon tattoo and i'm not alone in saying that but yeah. so that did not really tithe me over either, yeah so. i didn't want to disappoint myself so I, I i decided not to see it it might have been for the best so uh what was the last movie you've seen by the way last movie i saw was if bill street could talk what was what is this movie i don't know this uh it is a love story a tragic love story uh between two uh lovers uh, directed by a Miami native, Barry Jenkins, of Moonlight fame. It's a, it's a complex story uh, that takes place in, I would say, 1970s New York. And uh, it's between two young lovers that has a complexity uh, on race and the justice system and incarceration and the lengths that a family would go through uh, for their loved ones. Was this done prior to Moonlight? Uh, no, it was uh, done recently. Recently? Yes. That's interesting. And how was it? Oh, it was, it was great. Um, I found it really enjoyable, really suspenseful, um, but also beautiful that the love story that they, they told through the tragedy. So definitely you would recommend it then? Definitely. That's great. So we've been talking about how we're doing a Miami movie today. We're gonna, today we're going to cover 1994's Ace Ventura Pet Detective. This movie grossed $72 million domestically, and it was made for only around $11 million, so this was a big profit. Uh, it placed 16th in the box office in 1994, coming just behind Star Trek Generations and ahead of Stargate, so sandwiched between two space movies. There's no space in this movie, but there are animals, dolphins, and football players. IMDb is a little hard on this in my mind. It gives it a 6.9. Uh, the critics of uh, Rotten Tomatoes are uh, ruthlessly cruel to this and gave it a 46%. Uh, I don't think the critics get movies like this sometimes, but I'm here to tell you I do, so you're in good luck. The audience score likes it a little better, but still only at 57%. We're going to challenge that tonight, probably. So I, I do wonder how much of that has come in as modern reviews, because Rotten Tomato isn't necessarily an aggregation of at the time. Mm. It'll have critics come in in 2018, 2019, and rescore it. Yeah. So, uh, Chad, why don't you come first on this one? What were your expectations uh, for this one? You've Had you seen this one before? If so, what were your thoughts coming into it now? What were you expecting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't see it in theaters. I think I was about 10 or so when it came out, but I did see it on VHS, kids. That's a... Uh, that's a tape that you had to rewind before returning to the video store. Or you get charged a little bit extra if you didn't rewind it. That's correct. Yeah, and uh, I guess we should explain what a video store is, too, maybe on another <laughs> podcast. Um, but, yeah, uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's a 10-year-old seeing a wacky comedy, so it was a lot of fun at the time. I loved the animal aspect. Uh, loved the second one when it came out as well. Ernest. How about you? Is this a movie that you were familiar with beforehand? And if so, what were your thoughts coming in this time? I was familiar with it, although uh, the distance of time between when I, I first saw it and, and now, uh, I, I can't say that I, I watched it after originally seen it in the, the, the theaters. So you haven't seen it since 1994 then? Correct. Wow. So long wait. Thoughts coming in? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a great movie then to see in the theaters. And I actually double-checked with a, a good buddy of mine who I, I'd always go see movies with and and tried to verify, like, did we see this in the movie theater? This happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't just imagine it. Yeah. Uh, so did you do the second one when it came out as well? 
the second one, I I can't say that I, I did do it in a theater. It wasn't as memorable as the first. I agree with that. It's a different kind of movie, though. Yeah. I myself saw this one probably back as soon as it hit video, so shortly after it came out, so probably 95. Loved it. Uh, I'll admit, uh, I'm 10 years old at the at the point this movie is coming to me to, and I flat out don't get many things that happen in this movie, mm-hmm. and I'm still captivated by the animated nature of Jim Carrey, even though particularly the end of the movie just didn't make sense to me. I still had a great time with it. Uh, I saw Ace Ventura 2 and Nature Calls, and you know I really kept seeing that on TV. I always thought it was odd that the sake the sequel is always on TV, mm-hmm. and I hadn't done the original one probably since college. I think I stumbled into it. Uh, I think my dorm had like a collection of movies that you could just watch for free downstairs, and it was definitely in that. I'm gonna say it's been since 2009 since I had seen it myself. So uh, I I also I uh, had been away from it for a long time and it's interesting i didn't notice any age on it previously but i'm starting to notice some of the age on it now but i still have a really fun time with it i was 11 when i I saw this Mm -hmm. and right at the age where you're you're testing boundaries at the movie theater of uh trying to act a little bit more mature to get into those uh pg-13 movies yeah and this may have been the first successful film that I passed myself off as a 13 year old. Wow. That's like getting to ride a roller coaster for like when you like want to be tall enough to ride the go karts or the yeah. whatever. And as a short uh, kid who looked younger than he probably was, I, this probably came even later for me. So I certainly wasn't fooling anybody at 13, even at age 13. Mm, so. <laughs> I had the height advantage. Yes. Ernest is a tall dude. Very critical. What, what's life like over six foot tall? Um, it's it's better. I'm, I know you can just you can just say it. yeah, Chad. Chad and I are about five foot eight and five foot nine. So uh, great. Anyway, uh, we're about to get into this movie, and we want to warn everybody now that we're going to talk about everything about it. So we're going to spoil everything. We're going to have a good discussion about things, and to go into any depth, we have to do that. So we're going to go through a little break here, and I can't believe we just continue to get presidential endorsements. I mean, we've had various former presidents coming and endorse the show, and today. Bill Clinton, the president from 1994, is here to whoa, yeah, to plug the show. So uh, here we go. Here's your former president, Bill Clinton, coming in now. Bill Clinton, everybody. Wow. Should it be a surprise that a guy named Slick Willie loves Ace Ventura? Ace Ventura, pet detective. The film starts off on a, a beautiful day in Miami Beach as Ace is disguised as a delivery man uh, who is taking a large dog from the previous owner uh, to take it back to the previous owner's ex-girlfriend. Large man, small dog. Mm. Yeah, very small. It was a beach on Frigé. Although it would, would have been funnier if it was a large dog, like a big <laughs> Scooby-Doo Great Dane. That would be good. Uh, so he, we find that Ace doesn't make a lot of money. He is, uh, this pet detective business is not a lucrative business, but it's a business of passion for him because he, we go back home. Uh, we realize that he's there at his apartment and he has tons of animals. He has parrots, squirrels, iguanas, penguins, penguins coming out of his freezer. So, I mean, he's, uh, he's more than just an animal lover. He's a true enthusiast and very passionate about them. He's actually tracking down a rare albino pigeon for 25 grand and in the midst of that he finds out that snowflake the miami dolphins mascot has been abducted and so the dolphins call up ace ventura uh, the secretary had hired him previously to find her dog and hire him to find snowflake after assessing the scene of the crime at the stadium where Snowflake was abducted, Ace discovers that a, a rare gemstone is at the bottom of the tank, and he identifies it as part of the 1984 AFC Championship ring. Ace then makes a mission to track down every member of the 1984 AFC Championship Dolphins to find out who is missing the stone from the ring. It goes through a humorous montage where Ace tracks down people on the field, in the bathroom, in mailboxes even, going after everybody he can, scratching off names off the list, only to be frustrated to seem that nobody has it. Even chloroforms a dude on the track. (laughs) It cuts to a scene at an apartment building where one of the people from the Dolphins organization has seemingly committed suicide, but Ace Ventura, after assessing the crime scene, points out that the police detectives have missed something and that this is, in fact, a homicide. Here we really see that Ace is an awesome detective 
in general. Uh, he finally eliminates the list down to Ray Finkel, who was a kicker on the 1984 team who had actually missed what would have been the game-winning kick for the AFC Championship. So he tracks down Ray Finkel's parents uh, to find out where this mystery kicker has gone. After going out to Collier County in southwest Florida, Ace discovers that Ray is missing in action. No one knows where he's at. He also finds that while visiting Ray's parents' house, he discovers how much uh, Ray has an animosity for Dan Marino, who he blames for having the laces of the football uh, turned inwards. Dan later shakes his head no, saying he didn't, but this is the kicker's excuse for sure. Yeah. Laces out. <laughs> so he's more than more than an animosity. He wants to kill Dan Marino. Uh, he's got stuff all over his room labeled, uh, you know, killing kill Dan, Dan, like arrows through his face and, you know, uh, torturing photos of Dan Marino in his room. So he, we find out that he had gone to a mental institute Courtney Cox, the love interest of the movie, or you could say the compa- female companion is a better word for it, helps commit Ace to the same mental institute where Ray Finkel was committed to. And uh, there he finds Ray's possessions and has newspaper clippings that link Ray Finkel to Detective Einhorn, who's been giving Ace a very hard time. Yeah, he goes through those clippings. It was uh, The newspaper clipping mentioned a missing hiker named Lois Einhorn, who, as Russell mentioned, was the lieutenant in charge of the case, Ace is pondering the connection, and he finally makes the connection that Einhorn is Finkel. They're the same person. After this discovery, Ace follows Einhorn to the warehouse where both Dan Marino and Snowflake are being held hostage. There at the warehouse, Einhorn calls in the troops. Framing him for the kidnapping. Yes. And they they get into a fight with each other, and... Uh, Ace and Einhorn fight each other, but ultimately Ace is able to convince the police by exposing the secret, quite literally, that Einhorn is Ray Finkel and that this is a kidnapping of Finkel's doing. And so Dan Marino and Snowflake are then returned to the Super Bowl for the second half, at which point the Dolphins will later go on to win the Super Bowl, we assume, and he gets recognition over an intercom and then... uh, As people clap for him, he's fighting the Eagles mascot aggressively on the field because uh, it costs him the opportunity to get that white pigeon. So, As a Cowboys fan, that's definitely up there on my favorite scenes, punching the Eagles mascot repeatedly. So, Chad, before we get into things, why don't you just give us a quick rundown of who the major players are in the cast? Sure. So this movie stars Jim Carrey as Ace Ventura, who's brilliant, but absolutely insane uh, stars courtney cox as melissa robinson she is part of the front office with the miami dolphins sean young who is lieutenant lois einhorn you might recognize her as rachel from the blade runner series uh, tone loke miami native he is a he stars as um, emilio uh He is the dude who sings Wild Thing, if you're wondering. Really? Uh, Yes. Uh, Dan Marino stars as uh, himself. He deserves uh, an award for playing Dan Marino, very convincingly. Uh, Noble William, he plays Riddle. Uh, Hit up uh, Udo Kier. He's Ron Camp. And Troy Evans as Roger Podactor. Sounds good. Sounds good. Who was Podactor again? He was the other front office man uh, alongside Courtney Cox. He's the one that uh, committed suicide, but not really. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I was having. A, I, it wasn't connecting for me there. I got it now. I would like to make a correction. While Tone Loke is an amazing rapper of the early '90s, he is not a Miami native. Is he oh. not? I always hear him down on the Dan Levitard podcast with... Uh... He may be retired there right now. Ah, uh, well, uh, that's an excellent place to be. But he's retired. a Southern California boy. Ah. Uh, a, a lot of people go to Florida. Ernest, do, do people who move to Florida often not, like, are they not in enough? Like, if, like if you're from Florida, like, do you kind of look at it as like, oh, these guys are transplants? <laughs> you know, I, I think growing up in Miami, uh, you, you know... 
the difference between the locals and the, the transplants. Uh, but we welcome everyone all the same. Okay, that's that's fair. So uh, a couple of fun casting notes. Uh, Rick Moranis of uh, Ghostbusters and uh, Strange Brew, uh, you know, Canadian actor, actually turns down the role to play Ace Ventura. Hard to picture him in this. Also, Judd Nelson and Alan Rickman were apparently considered for the role. Uh, even harder to uh, predict that. And another consideration for the lead role was Whoopi Goldberg, which. Of the ones that were considered, this one seems like the most plausible to me. Lauren Holly was turned down the role, sorry, turned down the role to play, uh, uh, that was later played by Courtney Cox. Uh, she is later in Dumb and Dumber with Jim Carrey, so she does get to work with him still. So Same year. Yes, yeah. also 1994. So 94 is a big year for Jim. And uh, Carrie Ann Moss and Tia Leone were also considered uh, for the role of Melissa Robinson. I could maybe see Tia Leone uh, doing it, but I certainly can't see Carrie Ann Moss doing it. And uh, Tia Leone also works with Jim Carrey and uh, fun with Dick and Jane later. So uh, I could see Carrie Ann Moss. It'd be a meaner Melissa. Yeah, it would. A little sterner, but uh, she's pretty good as Hogarth. And I kind of imagine uh, in like the Daredevil and Netflix series, so I can kind of see the Hogarth type character as Melissa. Maybe, maybe. And then one last one that I just have to call out because uh, is the, the Ray Finkel's mother, Alice Drummond. She was previously in Ghostbusters as the librarian. So uh, she just recently passed away in 2016, but uh, uh, she's very distinct. You may hear me come back to her later. So this movie, I think, is interesting in that it's a performance piece. It's, it's not necessarily all about the story. The story does have some consideration to it, but what, what I think is strong about this movie that what the critics aren't probably understanding is that this movie is about Jim Carrey's talents. As a general format, they put serious actors around him and they let him explore the space and just go at it. I don't know what you think about that, but I mean, for me, I like to see... I, I think he's a comedic genius and I just think it's, he, it's always funny. He doesn't let up. It's just relentlessly funny. Yeah, for me, uh, I, I've known Jim Carrey from his prior work on the TV series In Living Color. So definitely this is his breakout role in film. And he was on full display of all the insane characters that he played on In Living Color, bringing out all those subtle nuances to the big screen in one character. He's like a human cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chad, what do you think about uh, Jim Carrey? Yeah, I, Jim Carrey is so interesting because he just has these distinct phases in his career. Ernest talked about the In Living Color, and uh, he had All in Good Taste, Once Bitten, Peggy Sue Got Married, Earth Girls Are Easy, uh, with Jeff Goldblum. That was that was really early Jim Carrey, but when he starts hitting it big with these crazy roles, Ace Ventura was the first one, but he has The Mask in the same year and Dumb and Dumber in the same year. What a big year 1994 was. But Batman Forever, uh, Ace Ventura 2, Liar Liar, all of those are just these insane characters and just outlandish. But he kind of tones it down. About 1998 with Truman Show, Simon Birch, Man on the Moon, The Majestic. He even does a horror movie with the number 23. He has some family roles that he, he chooses to do. He, he kind of did the zany How the Grinch Stole Christmas in 2000. But he's, he tones it down quite a bit for like A Christmas Carol, Mr. Popper's Penguins, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. In one of the interviews I've seen with Jim Carrey, he basically said doing these roles like Dumb and Dumber and Ace Ventura was literally making him insane. He may have stopped too late because he's a little crazy now. But uh, he does some almost like halfway roles where he's not crazy, but there's still comedies with me, myself, and Irene, Bruce Almighty, Fun with Dick and Jane, and Yes Man. But they're not... Never to the levels of that, you know, first four years of film with Ace Ventura, Mask, Dumb and Dumber, stuff like that. It's, it is interesting how he has that uh, division in his career. And like, I, like Ernest said, he was right. Like, you can see, like, he started as a stand-up comedian in Toronto and a sketch performer. And a lot of that energy that he has, uh, kind of a one-man act, does carry through yeah. in this. I find it really interesting that, um, you know, it... What we just went through tells a, a great arc of an actor 
of, you know, his roots started off in comedy. And thank goodness the role of Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, landed in his lap uh, because the comedy was getting to a point where it was driving him mad. But it, it drove him into being a mad genius in comedy. And his career took off from there and was able to expand. He was able to expand the show, the full variety of what he is as an actor later on. Yeah, and I've I've enjoyed him at every one of these evolutions. I think that he's an enjoyable, like particularly those family roles. I didn't see that coming. I really enjoy the wild and crazy guy. He is my favorite when he is being that really ridiculous, over the top physical comedian. Mm -hmm. And I think even I, I I'm not saying he's an, he's not that old even still, but I mean that's a very physical brand of humor. If you look at how he's carrying that box down the hallway, trashing the glass and stuff like that. And by the way, that's like a parody of like a UPS commercial. Like they had like a very smooth UPS man like handling <laughs> the box and not dropping it. Ace, on the other hand, is like crushing it, slamming it in the elevator, like stomping on it, like breaking it on purpose. And uh, it's a really fun parody of that commercial at the time. That's a very physical thing. I mean, he beats himself up. Like uh, another thing that comes to my mind is like liar, liar. Like when he goes in the bathroom, he's like jamming his face down on a toilet and like, like, you know, hitting himself on the counter and stuff like that. And he's really committing very hard to these things. It's not like they've staged all this stuff up for yeah. him. And he literally is beating himself up in some of these movies. And so it's a hard thing to continue to do once you're past a certain age. So uh, I think you have to grow past it. But boy, this movie and the other movies from here and through 2000 are just really uh, special to me. This is this is when I think of Jim Carrey. This is what I think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And just no one's doing it at the same level of the zany antics. Just there's nothing in the 2010s or even early 2000s. Aside from him, no I, one else is doing this. I would equate Chris Farley at the same time mm. with a similar brand of humor, but obviously, and, and very unfortunately, that wasn't sustainable for him either. He was the clown on the outside, but inside it, it was tearing him up yeah, as torturous. well. Yeah. So, yeah. The, but to be on Farley's level of energy and not kill yourself or to constantly be drunk and on drugs like Farley was all the time, I mean, that's a, I mean, so that's a true testament to. To carry i just i think i think chevy chase he he liked adding falls to his scenes now that's a little bit earlier but uh and he's sadly kind of a crank to work with but he liked a lot of the physical comedy as well yes absolutely i just got to talk about some of the let's go through what are some of the favorite things that ace does that just get your attention what are some of your other moments that, of ace that just like man i love this I laugh every time when he's at the crime scene for Roger's death and he's proving to the detectives, hey, this door couldn't have been closed. And <laughs> you you hear a scream and he does this by standing behind the door going, ah, while slamming the door back and forth, just still other than his arm moving back and forth to close the door. And you hear the scream, then you don't, and then you do. And he's just keeping this physical stance and this scream for much longer than it should have gone to prove the point while staring them down. And it just, it's hilarious. Uh, I really enjoy the scene where he's in Courtney Cox's office or Melissa's office and he's eating these sunflower seeds while watching this Dolphins video and uh, he's just so into it and like she's just trying to be like stop putting sunflower seeds on my desk and he just keeps going there's this pile of spit and sunflower seeds filling up on her desk and uh, she gives him a passive aggressive would you like an ashtray and he's like no no thank you it's a disgusting habit smoking. He's eating them like he's a horse with peanut butter on the roof of his mouth. It's just this chomping sunflower seeds. Yeah, that was great. I, I somehow didn't remember that one until I came back to it this time. You know, one thing that, that stood out to me throughout the entire arc of the film is that in, in certain instances, he would always uh, uh, sneak in a dog bark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he's like modeling himself after animal-like movements and mannerisms. He yeah. loves animals so much he's learned to communicate that way. Another really great one that I love is just watching him go around this uh, tank, assessing the crime scene with this wide-angle lens sticking his face in the camera, doing these impressions of Dr. Kirk, uh, Dr. McCoy, Scotty from Star Trek, and like going back and forth and having this inner dialogue with himself. 
this is a lot like what Ernest was talking about. Like you can see his ability as a stand-up comedian and using that as a performer and a sketch performer as well. It translates to this movie so well. This is a really good vehicle to transition him into a star star role. You just gave William Shatner a doctorate. It's Captain Kirk. Oh, I'm sorry. Good, good point. <laughs> <laughs> to to avoid any of the uh, trekkers or is it trekkies, according to fanboys? Are Star Trek fans name. particular? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, talking out of his butt too was another really great moment. That just to see a full grown man turn around and <laughs> ask you a few questions. And it's kind of great that he did that to Keenan Ivory Wayans in real life on uh, the set of In Living Color because he didn't feel like Keenan Ivory Wayans was listening to him. And then he just transitioned it to this film. Yeah, I read that. And apparently it escalated to a near fight, but it didn't go all the way to physical blows. But uh, that was Jim actually mocking somebody for real. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not Luckily just it worked out. For a movie, it actually happened. Yeah. You know, I. Uh, one other thing I was really surprised about um, in this film, um, which made it work, Jim being a, a pet detective, how easy and coy he is to get into police department um, scenes, uh, yeah. the actual the police department crime scenes. No one's questioning that, hey, you are a private eye. I get the gist that maybe he's helped do their job for them before because, like, he goes into that crime scene and everyone's mm-hmm. like, well, it's clearly a suicide. And then, like, you know, as Chad pointed out, like, he relishes in telling them how wrong they are. But at the end of the day, they were wrong. Yeah, so. it's a back and forth because he's doing the job that no one on the police force wants to do. Yet they revel in uh, poking fun at him for the, the jobs that they see as... Uh, minuscule and i like how ace is actually a smart character and or even physically quick enough to get out of the way of someone trying to bully him around the police station and uh he's always they won't he he doesn't let anybody get the best of him so he's always got the witty comeback he's always got the actually this is what's right The, the fact that ace is not just a buffoon character which is actually um uh we'll get into this a little bit later but uh he was originally written to be an idiot and like stumble through things and just be in the right place at the right time and it's so much better that it's not yeah so one other one that uh, i really 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 loved was the when he goes to the insane asylum he's got this tutu on and he's like got his hair all messed up and he's doing the damaged uh, brain damaged football player Mm -hmm. uh i love that and i like how he runs into the doctor there like like he's like crashing into like a slow motion like enactment then he says, let's see that in reverse. And then, like, he starts to talk in gibberish, and, like, his motions are so precise and, like, like whips himself back down into the chair. It's really good stuff. I mean, I think this looks like it would have been a fun... I'm sorry, a, a very fun movie to be part of, the movie making. He actually makes that same doctor laugh a little bit later when he slams his head into the bench to kind of just knock himself <laughs> out. You see the doctor laugh. He turns away. But they kept it in the film. And Gordon Cox is like, he'll be there for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. It's an oddly specific time, but sure. The doctor just walks away with her. So let's talk about the making of this movie just a little bit. Ernest, any thoughts on like the vision and the creation of Ace Ventura? For me, film placed itself beautifully in early 90s Miami. Uh, I remember myself just being off, fresh off a field trip to South Beach, to the Art Deco district with my art studio in elementary school. And literally the film captured every single area that we visited. So this was probably the first film that I was actually able to put in place in an actual uh, setting that wasn't a soundstage. They were definitely on location all across Miami. And they made good choices too with where to show, you're saying? Yeah, definitely. Um, the sets that they used, uh, the locations that they they scouted, uh, were all actual places that um, were in and around the city. Um, Greenwich Studios, uh, where Dan Marino is abducted from in North Miami. Um, Ace's apartment, uh, the Compton Apartments on Washington Avenue. To this day, pretty much literally looked the same. Really? 
uh, right next to the Cameo Theater, right next to the famed Española Way in Miami Beach. Um, that that corner, that that scene of the, that wide pan of kind of showing the introduction of him just pulling around the corner and parking right on Washington Avenue. Um, that for me, that was iconic and and of hey, this is of place. This is a movie of place. We're not. Hey. Fact, we're not faking that we're in Miami, but we're really here. Yeah, well, I got a strong feeling for not only the Art Deco, but also the postmodernism, which was down there as well mm-hmm. at the time, uh, architectural styles and that. And then, of course, you had the uh, the stadium. Joe Robbie Stadium. Yep. They actually used both football stadiums in Miami at the time. Um, the Orange Bowl Stadium, actually in the city of Miami proper. Joe Robbie Stadium, now known as Hard Rock Stadium. That's a great name for a football stadium. It's <laughs> only right. Yeah. So anyway, had you had you been to a game there? Oh yeah, definitely. Growing up in Miami, you, you can't help but go to a Dolphins game. Uh, but also, I would say uh, for the film, not only were the locations accurate, but the costumes were accurate to Miami. And I, I say this now, being um, someone who has left Miami, these are subtle things you never notice until you leave Miami. Just how unique. Your, the wardrobe is in Miami. So the people in Pittsburgh dress a little more drab, perhaps? Um, uh, more mild manner, I'll okay. say. So, uh, Things are a little bit more vibrant when you're in Miami. I do have to know, have you ever seen anybody walking down uh, in the street in Miami dressed like Ace Ventura with these like burgundy <laughs> and red striped pants with a giant belt buckle and like the open, uh, really goofy graphic Hawaiian shirt and... Uh, the hair swooped up with Ray-Ban sunglasses. And combat boots, too. There is a potential that there may be a few Ace Venturas walking around Miami. <laughs> but his unique walk is only his in his okay, own. Okay, that's, that, that's a good point. Uh, and as we were talking about earlier, it's kind of funny. And inside the actor studio, Jim Carrey said that uh, Anthony Hopkins and he were eating dinner and they talked about their approach. Hannibal, he compares Hannibal Lecter's prison cell uh, from The Silence of the Lambs to Ray Finkel's room. And, uh, you know, Hopkins said that he modeled his movement on animals, particularly reptiles, in the role of Hannibal Lecter. Oddly enough, like, that shows you the level of craft that Jim Carrey is doing in his character, too. As you mentioned before, he's doing these dog-like things. He's arching his back like a cat. He's moved slinking across uh, these areas in a very animalistic kind of way, and it's a very conscious decision on his part. It's always interesting to me that comedy is not always held up as the high form of acting, but if you compare, I mean, undeniably, that role of Hannibal is really an amazing role. Jim Carrey is transforming and picking up on the same mannerisms, different animals, obviously perhaps less threatening, more yeah. lovable animals, but um, Jim Carrey is doing the same thing and converting it, and instead of scaring people, he's making people smile and laugh, and I've never understood why one is considered high art and awesome like let's give this guy an award and the other one's just like haha that's that's disposable yeah. funny and I, w- I would say you know he's doing it very subtly in that like not only some of the the vocal cues of like uh, when he's snapping at somebody at the end of like talking getting in a, a yelp at them uh, but also um, those non-verbal cues of his movements like you say emulating animals yeah it's really really awesome chad what are your thoughts on the vision of the film i appreciate that they kind of changed the tone from just generic sherlock holmes to kind of a parody included the pets um jim carrey actually the animal he cited most was uh, a bird i kind of feel like he was a jack russell terrier that had just drank a bowl of red bull he's just all over the place (laughs) I don't know how much we want to get into the director, but Tom Shadiak basically tried to cut it down as much. So it was just joke after joke, laugh after laugh, never to get too serious for too long. So I appreciate all of that. Yeah, it was interesting to hear Shadiak talk about how this was a big risk, both for him and for uh, Jim Carrey. As you mentioned before, this is Jim Carrey's first big leading role uh, that's being promoted and like they're putting they're going out on a limb as well as this is Shadyac's first directorial effort he admits that he didn't know a lot about camera work he didn't know a lot about lighting and 
he was going into this thing a little bit in the dark. And his advice to people who are making films now, he's saying, you'll learn that stuff as you go, but it's not necessarily important to know everything. It's, it's important to find the people who will help you do these things. But if you have the vision, if you know what you want, then you can be a director. And it's kind of interesting. I equated that to also to like being in architecture school. I remember seeing like these complicated details of buildings and just being overwhelmed by it and being like, oh man, what are all these ducts and pipes and stuff running around these buildings? I'll never know all of this. And at some point you get to the point where you realize your role is not necessarily, as my role as an architect is not to know every single little thing. It's enough to know enough who to ask when the time comes to assess when there's a problem, whether something looks right or not. But you know enough to have the conversation with the people and know who to put on the scene at the right time, the right place. So I kind of, I see, I, I, I relate to that director role a lot with the design field because they're designing a movie and a vision and they're trying to make a vision come true. And so it was very interesting to hear Shady Act talk about it. And personally, I'm very passionate about comedy. I love, like I've, I've probably told people on this show before, like Saturday Night Live is my favorite TV show and to craft these things that make people laugh just gets me excited. So it's it's cool to see. Shadiac talks about being up at 4 a.m. in the morning working with Steve Oedekert and Jim Carrey writing this thing. It sounds like a blast to be honest with you, but uh, they're working very hard to try and find what would be funny, what would be response, what makes the other thing make sense because they are telling a detective story in between mm -hmm. and it's not just a giant gag reel either. I have to give this movie credit that it works uh, primarily as a uh, movie that's got like a really great mystery. Like the mystery is definitely in support of the comedy, but uh, I thought it was well enough done that it did not deserve these 54% kind of, you know, ratings and stuff like that either. So um, I don't know. Was it, maybe I'm being too generous with it uh, because I like comedy too much, but Ernest. How do you feel like the balance of mystery to comedy is in this? For me, it, it was uh, perfectly balanced. Um, and the, at the end of the day, it's a comedy, but they were able to, to string together a cohesive narrative uh, of an actual detective story and, and do it in a convincing fashion where uh, you reveal the reveal uh, happens at a good pace. You know, it's not too early, not too late. It's not uh, lacking and you're wondering hey, between all these laughs, what happens to the story? Um, all the comedy is over the top, uh, and they, they found a way to, to balance out between that that over-the-top narrative of, of, of the comedy, how to, to work in an actual story, and a good story at that. Yeah, and I think that's one of the interesting things. You you said you like this one better than Ace Ventura 2, When Nature Calls. Yeah, that one's forgettable. It's a different kind of movie. It's an adventure movie. Yeah. He goes over to Africa and he ends up going and getting involved with the search for this bat and these tribes and stuff like that. But there's a sense of gumshoe kind of the pet detective component of Ace that shows that he's maybe not quite autistic, but he's definitely at the other end of the spectrum where he's not on uh, he's not on this planet with with everybody else with all the regular people here, and he's he he hums along on his own wavelength. And uh, somehow that works better when you surround him with the dry characters of like this big goon who he's stealing his dog from, the rich uh, uh, elite guy uh, at the party like uh, Ron Camp, who's or the tough police detective of Einhorn. And if you have all these super serious people there, it only further accentuates how loony and how far out there that Jim Carrey's character of Ace Ventura really is. So yeah. uh, that's a, a I think this movie plays off of juxtapositions so well. I love the cartoon scene where he's in the shark tank and just like, uh, it's like- Splailing uh, everywhere. Yeah, I mean, if it was a real <laughs> like shark, he'd be chopped in half and that would be it. It would be something more like Jaws, but they speed up the film and like he's like paddling his arms and like flailing back and forth in the pool. And I literally felt like I was watching Bugs Bunny. Mm -hmm. And um, even at age 34, I, I sit here watching this and I'm going like, it's just funny. Chad, how do you think this movie's aging? I think it's had a tough time, especially in the in the recent years. There are some scenes that uh, culture has just changed. They can be explained, but there's going to be a certain section of the population that is just going to have a tough time. And you know, we're ha we're 
basically talking about how Ace's reaction to a finding out he had kissed someone of the same gender. He freaks out, he showers, he plunges his face, throws up in the toilet. Then later on, you know, everyone throws up when they find out Einhorn is Ray Finkel. Well, 2018, 2019 hasn't aged as well. Uh, I feel like the physical comedy is still there, but uh, the criticism is definitely there as well from uh, the LBGT community. It did get uh, grilled even in 1994. From you know, it's funny. Tom Shadyac uh, has admitted that he probably wouldn't do that exactly the same way now. He didn't have ill intentions, and it's one of those things where after you do it, you then realize. And so uh, it wasn't done from hate. Uh, he wanted to just it, it, Ace does everything dialed up at eleven. Yep. So he doesn't. He reacts to this surprise at eleven. But uh, at the end of the day, you're right. I think you could actually cut it very simply. I think. I think if you were going to show this on TV today, I might make one cut. Uh, and so from the time that he realizes Einhorn is Finkel, Finkel is Einhorn, Einhorn is Finkel, Finkel is Einhorn. That's funny. And even the brushing the teeth in the mirror, I think that's funny. Maybe you don't show him like burning his clothes and getting into the shower and plunging his face. And then you just cut straight to the car with him putting a lot of gum in his mouth, which yeah. that's another physically funny scene of just like seeing him jam all this gum into his mouth. That would go a long way in correcting some of the problems. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I do think told from the story of Ace overreacts to everything. That's his character. Uh, It's it's kind of in in character for him to do what he did. Uh, I I would want to keep the plunger just because that's a hilarious scene. It's a it's a unique piece of physical comedy. But uh, I agree, the shower and maybe the throwing up at the end could easily be cut to be a little more sensitive to the time. I kind of uh, go a little bit more on this scene. Definitely, it does not hold up um, um, in today's climate. Uh, But at the time when the movie came out, it was a a few years removed from uh, the film The Crying Game. Mm -hmm. And a similar gender reveal scene a little bit different um, style of a gender reveal scene in that that film. And the -the over-the-top reveal of Finkel as Einhorn, uh, I believe, is a response to that film and the seriousness of the film, Mm -hmm. and that being such a suspenseful um, thriller and how that reveal happened, how shocking that, that reveal was in that film. Absolutely a parody. They play the song called The Crying, the crying Game, Game twice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so at, at every moment in, in Ace Ventura where, you know, that aha reveal of, of that, you know, they're playing the Boy George, George song, The Crying Game. Interesting. So does it come off as being... I have not personally seen The Crying Game. And don't worry, Chad has made a point of his life of spoiling movies for me uh, along, along the way. <laughs> but This one's on the shirt. Yeah, he has a little shirt that has all these movie spoilers written all over it. It's, it's the worst shirt ever. Anyway, the uh, Crying Game. Is this something that, as someone who has seen the Crying Game, is this something you see as parody and like reference? Is it like clear? Like when I'm watching Young Frankenstein, I know like, oh, this is what happened in Frankenstein. They're doing, they're playing off of that. Yes. Yeah. Parody yeah, it's reference. Pretty clear. Yeah. Oh, well, then that might change my view on it a little bit. Obviously, it is still transphobic. It is still. A little bit uh, insensitive, but uh, maybe, yeah. So, like I said, I, I was thinking I'm not I'm not one for censorship really, but uh, yeah, except when Brian Cuss is on the show. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so one thing I do like that they do that humanizes Ace is his love of animals. They take these moments in there too. Like he gets really mad at Melissa, and he ends up apologizing to her again. Ace is kind of a jerk to those who don't take the time to understand him. But another important thing with a comedy is you want your comedic hero to be likable. And Shadyac and Carrie were very careful to craft moments like that into the character that you like Ace. Again, we just talked about how smart he was and how talented he was, but he's not a jerk. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch in The Imitation Game or something like that, where he's like going and trashing everybody or like Steve Jobs, like, you know, I'm brilliant and I'm going to like walk all over you. That wouldn't be a fun movie. So Ace is a lovable uh, idiot, and uh, it, it does show that he has a softer side as well, 
although he does have a temper, and that darn Philadelphia Eagles mascot mm-hmm. definitely ruined his investigation for the $25,000 white pigeon. Not all pets are loved equally. <laughs> Interestingly enough, you were talking about uh, the football connection on this one. Chad was relishing in the fact that the 1994, the real Super Bowl winners of this was the Dallas Cowboys. I, I personally... Uh, as a Pittsburgh Steeler fan, hate the Dallas Cowboys, and this was the worst Super Bowl ever because not only was it uh, the second Super Bowl in a row where the Buffalo Bills lost to the Dallas Cowboys, but uh, it, there was a kick by Scott Norwood that was particularly painful in this. And this comedy, uh, obviously that was a lot fresher in people's memories, was largely formed and based around the fact that Scott Norwood missed this very critical kick. Again, Chad's smiling right now, so... <laughs> Yes, I am. Talking about more football connections. The Dolphins never never in, in modern history have had a, a dolphin as a mascot. A, an actual live dolphin. They don't have a... Do they have a plush dolphin? They do. Dolphin? TD. Okay. He's lovable. He's awesome. Uh, but actually having a mammal at the game, um, they did experiment with that in the first two seasons of the Dolphins' existence. And uh, accurately, as the the film depicts, um, they used uh, dolphins from the Miami Seaquarium. Uh, But that was only in the first two seasons of the franchise as a way of also, I would assume, enticing fans to come out and support the team. Hmm. Well, now they come for the football. But another interesting mammal thing, um, I, I would say, about the dolphins and or the when snowflake is first introduced in the film they never explain it away in the, in the film but they they use two different stadiums and they start off in the miami orange bowl which is the the first stadium where the dolphins played at present day um the orange bowl is the site of the uh, miami marlins baseball team marlins stadium mm-hmm. ironically the marlins behind the home plate do have two aquatic fish tanks uh, oh okay that's cool so there, there is a, a loose connection of um, actually using aquatic animals at a place that's in the film. Have they? Has anyone ever stolen the fish? Uh, the fish have not been stolen, but there has been an incident uh, where a foul ball has cracked one of the, the fish tanks. Oh, wow. There was a mad scramble to, to make sure. All nobody, the fish were recovered, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No one spilt out, but uh, yeah. One of the interesting things I thought, I, so there's a lot of good stuff from Shadyac on this uh, movie because this is his first and it's an important one for him, as well as it is for Carrie. But he talked about Jim as a comedian really enjoying a range of comedy. And we capture this cartoonish nature of him in this movie, but that wasn't really all that Jim wrote into this. There was a scene where the, he went into a gas station after coming from Finkel's parents. And there was an attendant committed, like thinking about committing suicide. And Ace insensitively, like, is too driven by doing what he's doing. Another example of him being in his own world. And the guy, like, commits suicide, like, there's a big blood splat on the wall. And Shadyac cut it out, saying, like, when he showed it to, like, kind of some people, it, it didn't go well. And, and there's another one where, do you remember in the warehouse where the uh, two hitmen who are kind of helping out and like he th- he like releases this big crane hook yeah if you look carefully it cuts really abruptly and you don't really see them get hit by it yeah it's originally written so that those two guys are decapitated and you see like dummy heads like roll on the ground again and like blood on the ground and stuff like that uh there was another one where when he's chasing in his car and the car flips and he is like in a coma like cloudy dreamlike state and he sees the white pigeon, and he goes out to catch the white pigeon, but then all these other birds start coming in and mauling him, and like he like dies in the dream, and then he wakes up. And Shadyac was saying that we realized, even though that Jim likes this dark humor and stuff like that, it didn't fit or service the film. And even in a different context, some of those things sound funny on paper. They, done, they didn't fit what this was. And so Shadyac actually did a lot of cutting of things like that, and so it's an interesting thing. You can see Carrie, you, you know, if you've seen Cable Guy and stuff like that, it, Carrie has a dark side for sure. And it's interesting how Shadyac and Carrie work together to make something that does come out a consistent tone. As you mentioned, it, feel, it felt balanced. And it's not a coincidence that Shadyac and Carrie work again on uh, Liar Liar 
and Bruce Almighty, as well as he's worked on other movies such as Patch Adams and Nutty Professor that have this kind of uh, tone to it as well. Yes, no? Too dark? For those... No, I think it's a great decision to eliminate that. This is really meant to be a lighthearted comedy and just laugh all the time, not kind of cringe and go, eh, maybe that's okay to laugh at. Yeah. PG-13, I was surprised to see there was a scene where he and Courtney Cox come back to his apartment and all the animals are around. Shady X thought this was like by far the hardest scene. Like this took months to set up. Three months to set up this scene with all these animals coming in because animals are completely unpredictable. You don't know what they're going to do. You really can't orchestrate them. And so this was an re- incredibly hard shot for them to shoot. But uh, I remember seeing uh, Jim Carrey and Courtney Cox. And again, I'm 10 years old when I'm seeing this going like, I don't understand what's happening in anything in the scene. And it's like they were just like flying around under the covers or whatever, like a Tasmanian devil. And uh, and it is funny. I, I, I find myself watching that now going like, man, I didn't know you could get away with that at PG-13. So. <laughs> I agree. Um, I, I felt the same way when I was re-watching it in that. I, now that I'm, I'm older and, you know, I have a, a niece and nephews, I, I found myself in a, a parental role of saying, I don't, I don't know if I, I would allow my niece and nephews to watch this if they were around that age. Yeah. And, um, but also, you know, the over-the-topness. Obviously, you know, as adults, we, we, we get what's going on in the scene. But uh, also, it took me a while there to remember back to when I was 11. And, yeah, this, the, the laughs here, as a, a 10, 11-year-old, and then it hit the mark. You're just like, I don't, I don't get what's going on here. But for the adults and that would uh, take a, a near uh, thirteen year old to the the film, though this was the the laughs for them. Definitely. Yeah, you're paying attention to the animals, like the parrots, really. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh wow. The monkeys jumping up and down. There's a lot of animals. Kids in are this laughing scene. at the animals doing fun <laughs> things. <They're... laughs> There's something for everybody in this film. That's right. Yeah. It had to be a super awkward scene. I know Courtney Cox said like the animals were jumping in bed and stuff, but he, even just trying that with all the animals chained down would just that's odd. And again, like we talked about, like Jim's used to like being physical and like throwing himself around, but uh, to be, uh, you know, Courtney Cox is not like a big strong lady or whatever. To be like uh, like slamming around in there, like it looked like uh, looked like she had to commit on that one as well. So. So what do we uh, think about Courtney Cox? Uh, she's pretty much your main supporting role throughout this. Chad, is she there for you? She's not. <laughs> I, I thought she was just completely irreplaceable. She, I know she said in interviews how fun this was, but I just don't see that coming through in her performance. It just, she's almost too much of a straight man, straight girl in this movie to really uh, have an impact for me. I, I kind of wanted either stronger negative reactions or stronger positive reactions one way or the other. She just rides the fence too much for me. Hmm. Interesting. Ernest? You know, I, I felt a little bit differently and, and maybe, the, you know, this is um, having the time to, to, to be away from the film from when it first originally aired. I, I felt that um, in a supporting role, she was perfect with Jim. And obviously this set her up for bigger things later on. It was a, not only a, a breakout for him, but it was a breakout for her. I, it's that is true. You're right. Because screams after this, and uh, you're right. The, this is and a, friends. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think of friends as being earlier than that, but you're absolutely right. This is '94. That hasn't happened yet. So yep. uh, she does have a few roles in the '80s, but you're right. This is a step in a step in the right direction for her. I don't know. I I, I enjoyed her. I thought that it, she served the fun tone, whereas sometimes you'll see a female role that's only there to look pretty. I didn't feel like she fell victim of that. I mean, she certainly is pretty and stuff like that, but they also, they weren't flaunting her either. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. she looked like she, she had some nice dresses on and stuff like that, but like, I mean, it wasn't just there to, she wasn't an appendage. I thought that she looked like that she was making the humor come out of Jim. And, and that's the way uh, the director Shadiac was saying, Jim made everybody in the studio laugh and that, Courtney had a good chemistry with him that he enjoyed making her laugh and that helped him be better at what he was doing. So maybe it didn't come across in service of the film, but at least keeping your star happy, that that's a pretty valuable thing too. 
You know, if there was uh, one other thing I wanted to add was that I thought the the film was clever in the foreshadowing of the Finkel is Einhorn reveal. Yeah. And that the there was like three times where it kind of foreshadowed that. And Ace is a first encounter with Einhorn mm-hmm. when he's um, when he's kind of messing around in the police department and um, doing the butt joke. Yeah. And Einhorn abruptly walks up on him and he screams out, Holy Testicle Tuesday! <laughs> That's a good line. And then, um, obviously, when they're in the in the apartment at the murder scene, he's playing with the dog in Pit Actor's apartment. Um, the other foreshadowing event is uh, when Ace is hanging out with Pit Actor's dog. Mm-hmm. And as soon as Einhorn comes in uh, to the scene and to the frame, the dog immediately barks at her. Oh, Kind of yeah. implying like, hey. I don't like you. Yeah. Yeah, because animals know. Again and again, there's a, a foreshadowing of what's going to happen towards the latter part of the film. I might not have picked up on all those things, but now that you're mentioning them, I can start to piece them together. It's kind of an interesting thing that you would appreciate on a second viewing. Your gun is sticking in my holster. That one I didn't yes. catch. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A couple of the effects and stuff that go into making this movie. And the uh, car that we talk about, the 72 Chevrolet Monte Carlo uh, uh, that's all busted up. It's kind of fun, in fact, to know that uh, it looks like a whole group of men came in there and damaged this car. But in reality, that scene that they shoot with the goon who trying to get his dog back. That is what he did to the car. He's just a really big, <laughs> strong dude beating up a car with, uh, you know, with a bat and a bar. And they did crack the window, and they made sure to have a stunt driver drive this thing around with his head out the window the whole time. <laughs> I love it. It's it, it it again. It's that animalistic like quality of him, like being a dog and sticking his head out the window and just seemingly loving it. Another cartoon moment too is when he's got his head out the window and they're shooting bullets at him, and he catches one in his teeth. Mm. So, Chad, we talked a little bit about uh, the uh, piano, or sorry, not the piano, the Crying Game song, uh, but uh, what are some of your other uh, soundtrack moments from this? Uh, we got some fun referential songs in here. And there were some odd ones here. <laughs> so Ace, when he sneaks into a, a club, it's Cannibal Corpse in the background. That's the metal band. They're singing, uh, well, is much as Cannibal Corpse sings, Hammer Smashed Face. Uh, so that was that was an interesting cameo from a band. I don't know if they had Miami connections or if someone was just a fan or what. But Shady X the... said that he wanted them in there because he felt like that aggressive tone in the music fit Ace Ace's wild nature. They're and I, I would say they're they're not from Miami, but they are Miami adjacent. They are a Florida band from Tampa. Interesting. So that's, uh, oh. so there is, so it was either that or Tom Petty and it turns out Cannibal Corpse is considerably cheaper than Tom Petty. So, uh, <laughs> go ahead. I, don't, I don't know what an Ace Ventura type band would be, but I don't, I don't see Ace listening to Cannibal Corpse, but that's, that's neither here nor there. But, uh, yeah, they sneak in the Mission Impossible theme when he's sneaking into I love that. Uh, the Shark Tank room. I love that. Yeah, he does the uh, cartoonish sneaking. He kind of models that in the Grinch later on, I think, of the animated Grinch. Yeah, that's a good callback. Yeah. uh, They fit in The Lion Sleeps Tonight for the love scene. Yep. When all the animals are just going bananas. Uh, Aerosmith's Line Up Love. Uh, That's when he's chasing down the, uh, the culprits. And again, the crying game, it's mentioned... It's played twice during uh, Einhorn Revelations. We'll just put it that way. You know, the only only thing I, I wish they could have worked into the film is uh, Tone Loke's Aces in the House. Yeah. Used oh, only yeah. during the credits scene. Yeah, yeah, that's in the credits, yeah. They yeah. could have maybe in there. Emilio as, uh, you know, off-duty, likes uh, hanging out at bars and rapping. They could have snuck it in that way. But... That, that would have been fun. Ace, what are you doing here as I'm rapping about you in the house? <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed the uh, the music montage that you're doing the Aerosmith lineup song that you were talking about. 
I just, like you were talking about the chloroform, like, you know, like chasing down these guys in the bathroom, like getting hit in the face was another one. Like, you know, he's got like a ring in dent so he can count all the stones that are like on the imprint on his forehead. I really like the pimple kid that goes up and like gets like an autograph sign. He's like, <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, a lot of times you get like a montage and it's an obligatory way to like get exposition done. But in this case, you had some fun cameos. Don Shula. Yep. Is, is in there. I think some other former players as yeah. well. Lots of uh, Dolphins players during that era uh, were, they were, all those players were actual Miami were, Dolphins football players. I suspected that might be the case. I didn't actually dig that one out, but. Uh, showing the full range of um, acting talent on the team. I kind of had a problem with this, though. It makes the assumption that all of the 84 Dolphins were somehow local. I mean, maybe by some chance they'd all come back to the Super Bowl. Everybody but I moves there, to they... Florida when they retire, man. So football players are going to move to Florida too when they retire. If you already live in I... Florida, you're going to move to Florida. I guess. No state income tax, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> in a scene with catching a bullet in the teeth, that's what I found unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> of all the over-the-top scenes... That one, that that one took the the cake. Chad, Chad was like, "You sir have gone too far now." <laughs> it's like our friend Chris, who's fine with Lord of the Rings as a whole, but it drives him nuts when they're reforging Aragorn's sword, and they're just basically banging on pieces of metal to reforge it. And he's like, "That's not how it works. You have to melt it down." <laughs> they're elves; they can do what they want. So this is my elvish moment, I guess. Uh, but what I was saying, but this montage is a lot of good jokes strong together you're laughing a lot this is actually one of my favorite parts of the movie a high density of laughs in there and that kind of goes back to what you were saying chad about how shady act was trying to cut everything and keep the laughs the big laughs rolling he was even going out saying like mild laughs that might do well in other movies or whatever i was cutting them out too because we wanted to keep the pace high so expectations are big once you make people laugh big once you come out of a bathroom with your pants all shredded up and water in your pocket and uh in a, in a fancy party, you, you know you've kind of set the bar, and you gotta kind of you gotta keep meeting the bar there. <laughs> Do not go in there. Woo! <laughs> uh, maybe it's time to go into look for this now. Ernest, do you have any great look for this moments? This being the the first of of many Miami movies that I, I start to pay attention to, and how a uh, director. Kind of cuts the film and how does it feel of place? Uh, one thing that that kind of stood out to me is that uh, although verbally referred to as the Miami Police Department, mm-hmm. uh, the police force comes out of the South Dade Police Department building. Oh, the actual location isn't isn't what it is, but I, I thought that was interesting how it is the Miami the Police Department always. The arm seals are of the, the actual county police force, and the building that they're coming out of is a subsect of the county police force, South Dade Police Department, and not the Dade County Police Department or the City of Miami Police Department. And there's Ernest Elvish reforging of the sword moment that's a very 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 detailed that that's good that's what the, that's what look for this is for chad look for this if you saw this movie on vhs when it first came out not in theaters you saw a different movie than what was in theaters for one scene when ace is searching for clues in snowflake's tank the press is there and ace pops out and he's this ridiculous foreign stereotype i think he called his name heinz and so when i was re-watching it i was like where's the dolphin trainer heinz where is this scene and i had to find out hey that was only in the vhs it was actually a cut scene the theatrical movie didn't have it huh was it funny should it, should it have stayed in there I enjoyed it. I mean, it's just more Jim Carrey being ridiculous. I want this scene back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's. I think it was Swedish or something like that. I, I didn't look it up on YouTube, but he's just doing this ridiculous foreign character who's a dolphin trainer. So fun fact, the picture of Ray Finkel that has uh, him with his helmet off and the mustache, that is actually Sean Young with a different uh, hairpiece and a mustache on her face. And... It is kind of convincing. Yeah. Yeah. 
I actually didn't know that. I figured they just got a completely different guy. They did not. Yeah. That is that is Sean Young. Ernest, do you have any other ones? Yeah, another Miami moment. And I talked about it a little bit earlier, but they, they used two different stadiums. Somehow they want you to believe that the Miami Orange Bowl, which ha- is decorated loudly in orange, yeah. is also Joe Robbie Stadium, which is loudly decorated in teal. So you can notice throughout the movie when you're in what stadium just because of those those colors. Thanks for clearing that up because I wasn't real clear on that. I wonder why they switch stadiums like that. That's expensive to go to two locations. Yeah. I start to look into it a little bit. 93 was the inaugural season of the Florida Marlins uh, baseball team, uh-huh. now Miami Marlins. And at the time of the filming uh, was right during the season, the baseball season. So obviously uh, Joe Robbie Stadium was converted into baseball format and not football format. Got it. Okay. So there was only so many scenes you could film at the stadium when the team wasn't in town and certain angles you could take that felt like it was still the football. It, the Orange Bowl is clearly a big stadium. Right. I mean, the Orange Bowl was there that you could always use, but Joe Robbie Stadium, was yeah. the more modern stadium that was uh, used by both teams. It's in there in the end, It's in, yeah. but not in the beginning. That is another, man, good good detail work. This is This is why we brought a local on for this one. Uh, Jad, any other ones? At the police station, they they refer to Ace Ventura as uh, St. Francis. The character Woodstock actually does. That's actually referencing St. Francis of Assisi. He's the Catholic patron saint of animals. And there's actually a St. Francis statue at Shady Acres, which itself is a uh, based off of Tom Shadyac. Shady Acres, get it? Mm-hmm. So That's what he names his production company later. Double reference. Yeah. I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention that Ace Ventura uh, Pet Detective has a TV series that's an animated show for children. Uh, It's interesting, again, we were talking about all this adult content, but it later converts to a show for kids on CBS for two years and then on Nickelodeon for another one, voiced by Michael uh, Dangerfield. as And actually, Seth MacFarlane, a family guy, was a writer on the show, so... Uh, yeah, he was involved with a zany cartoon before Family Guy, so wow. kind of fun. And actually, I remember seeing some of this cartoon. I was getting a little bit older for Saturday morning cartoons, but from what I saw, it was pretty enjoyable. Not to be confused with Ace Ventura Pet Detective Jr., which was made in 2009, was horrible. I didn't know about that. <laughs> that doesn't sound as good just based on slapping a junior on the end of it. But uh, <laughs> anyway... Um, Ernest, how does this movie affect you? For me, this is the Miami Beach of my youth. You know, it, it captured it. It captured that 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 first field trip to Miami Beach, and really like looking at it for um, its artistic qualities, mm-hmm. uh, art artistic and architectural qualities, uh, because that that's my first formal entry into South Beach of understanding um, the Art Deco district. And it captured the essence of Miami Beach during that time. I, and that, that resonated with me in the film. And every time I look at this film, I, I enjoy that it, it captured that moment in time because it's totally different now. And it'll always change in the future. But for that moment in time, like it was the first film that, that put me in a place where, where I knew um, of that place. That is cool. Uh, and it is. If somehow you get an extra enjoyment of a movie when you really know the place that it's being shot in. So I, yeah. I do know what you're talking about. It's like, about. hey, I know that place. That's real. They did a good job. And it's even more disappointing when they say it's in a certain place and then it's not. Mm. Like, uh, I, Chad and I are from West Virginia, and so the, the Mothman Prophecies uh, is based on a situation in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. <laughs> And uh, they shot in Western Pennsylvania, and so Oof. so that didn't go over well with people in West Virginia. It's like, why? Just come on down. Mm. So anyway, yeah, they made the Charleston Marriott this little shack. Like, what the heck? <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, I would say another thing. One famous TV series of recent years that is uh, supposedly based in Miami, CSI Miami. Yeah. Not Miami. Most of the scenes are in Southern California. Oh, no. Mm. That seems like a rivalry, like a, yeah. Mm. East Coast, West Coast. No West Coast for me, sir. No. Mm. Chad, how's this one, how, how, how does this one affect you? 
it simultaneously makes me happy and sad. Uh, I love this version of Jim Carrey. Uh, this is kind of growing up, uh, early adolescent, preteen years to teenage years, and just love the physical comedy. And I'm I miss that in theaters. There's just not really anything out there today like it. But it makes me sad too because Jim Carrey just doesn't do this anymore he i almost feel like he takes himself too seriously now he's kind of uh he's had some disappointing controversies after this with uh jenny mccarthy anti-vaxxing and all that garbage too but uh yeah it's just it makes me sad i want jim carrey to go back to being this guy but i get for his health (laughs) and mental health reasons that uh he can't do this all the time he is 57 years old so that's okay well i'm saying he doesn't look like he's 57 years old but i mean it's hard to go throwing yourself around and like being so pliable at age 57 it's up to somebody else to take that mantle is what i say he's done a great job but i mean i didn't see jerry lewis going around at uh age 60 either you know going crazy and go hi ladies (laughs) one of my favorite tv shows that's now canceled uh was community and chevy chase kept insisting on uh adding Pratt falls to it and like tripping over band equipment and stuff and then he was well into his 70s at this point now the cast didn't always get it and the director didn't always get it they're like eh, no we're not going to do that but he was still in his 70s like throwing in Pratt falls and things like that for me uh this one comes down to as i mentioned seeing a movie as a kid being able to enjoy it and not fully understanding everything that's happening and watching it at two levels and i kind of described that a little bit earlier out of sync there but Mary, uh, my wife, uh, has a really funny story where her cousin Jeremy, who was only three years old at the time, uh, just for whatever reason, probably due to the cartoon, probably said to his grandmother, I want to see Ace Ventura Pat Detective. And um, she gets it for him. Again, this movie is hard PG-13. And and, uh, so he gets it. And because he's three years old, latches on to everything that they said. So he would go around to people uh, in real life and being like, like, you mean she's a he? Um, <laughs> or le oh. he a her. <laughs> and so um, I'm talking out of your butt and everything like oh that. My gosh. So uh, it's funny that Ernest had mentioned that like parental thing. But Mary's grandmother was a very fun, uh, loving person who uh, had a little bit of bad language and stuff for herself and was always... Uh, so She liked it herself and was just having fun with it. And so for some reason, seeing a three-year-old do all this was all fun. So Sometimes uh, it's, it's okay to just lighten up, I guess. Well, nobody got hurt. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite time of the show, movie superlatives. You guys ready? Let's do ready? it. Ready? MVP, Ernest. Jim Carrey. Wow, didn't see that one coming. I mean, it was very close. I, I almost chose Dan Marino, but, um, you know, Jim Carrey just barely edged him out. This isn't Dan's best work. I feel like his best work's done in the Nutris, uh, system commercials. <laughs> <laughs> Isotoner commercials. Mm. Yep, those those were big back in the 90s, his isotoners. I like how they actually kidnapped him off the set of a commercial. <laughs> like, they like, had two actors go in and like, tackle him and like, carry him out of the street. And the director's like, guys, cut. Cut, guys. <laughs> uh, Chad, MVP, and I'm guessing you're not going to say it's Courtney Cox. No, no, not, not Monica. Um, yeah, any Jim Carrey comedy, I feel like it's automatically going to be Jim Carrey. He's the conductor of the entire thing it's he a, makes it go it's a clean sweep i like jim carrey for this as well best supporting actor ernest for this one i have to go with courtney cox okay yeah i think i i get that i mean she hierarchically by far is the second most important person in this movie but i'm gonna guess chad's gonna go another way what are you what are you going with for best supporting actor chad i'm going with the I'm guessing it's a parrot and someone that knows birds better than me. It was a small parrot that's uh, rocking out during the love scene and is eating bird seed out of Jim Carrey's belly button at one point. Like that's a, that took a lot of training, I'm sure. So maybe, maybe also best supporting actor, whoever the animal trainer was, but the parrot for me. Okay. Okay. 
the penguins were my favorite animals in the apartment just coming out of the freezer that was like the like most <laughs> over the top moment like yeah. um the uh my best supporting actor though i'm gonna go with udo kier uh i really like this guy he's not in it as much as certain other people but he's the ron camp he's the wealthy uh guy throwing the party he does this uh like i'm this aristocracy kind of person and i find all of you hard to understand ace ventura <laughs> and so <laughs> courtney cox this beautiful woman comes in in this beautiful dress and with he's like is this your date <laughs> and um that he does that part so well so he does he comes off as being slimy rich guy really well and adds uh, there aren't many other supporting actors i mentioned who add to the humor i think he did so that's he's gonna get that for me hidden gem uh ernest who is kind of your underappreciated moment or the piece of the cast that uh you might overlook but you deserve to get they deserve to get some credit well and this kind of works with the the supporting actor, but Sean Young, uh-huh. because that, the way I see it is, um, you know, you take Courtney Cox and Sean Young, and they're kind of playing a bit of the foil to Jim Carrey's like hilariousness. Mm-hmm. So you have a more, you have two strong women, one being really strong, and one being supportive, and the two of them together work well uh, with the -the over-the-topness of Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chad, who is your hidden gem? Alice Drummond, who played Mrs. Finkel. She's just this sweet old lady who really, really hates Dan Marino. And she just utters some of these awful lines, like, Dan Marino should die of gonorrhea and rotten hell. And then just says, (laughs) would you like a cookie? And it's just... It comes off as natural and sweet and just naive to the fact her son's a psychopath. I'm right there with you. She does she does vacant uh, mother so well, and yeah, I just I love it when she walks into his room and uh, it's covered with like murder plans for Dan Marino and die Dan die. And she goes, <laughs> "What a sports nut, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> Those laces out cookies they they were beautiful. Like they should be. Yeah. Uh, if you had to recast somebody in this, who would you recast? And any ideas of who you would put in their place, Ernest? Well, you know, I, I thought a little bit of what if you remade uh, Ace Ventura uh-huh. in modern day 2019? Okay, yeah. I would love to see the kidnapped sports star be Dwayne Wade. Oh, that would be good. I'd, and I, he probably would be a better actor, too. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Chad. I'm recasting Courtney Cox. Sorry to everyone else, but, uh, yeah. Don't say Jennifer Aniston. Uh, I am going to replace her with a Friends alumni, but I'm actually going to go Lisa Kudrow. Okay. All right, all right. I don't feel like that role demands, like, huge sex symbol, and I think Lisa Kudrow could have a little more fun with it. Uh, Still be the straight person, but have a little more fun. Okay. All right. I I like her. I'll go along with that as well. And along those lines of doing a substitution with something else that you know somebody from, I'm actually going to go after Sean Young on this one. I don't know why I felt like the tough stuff that she was doing. I feel like when you're in a comedy and you're a tough guy person, uh, like I always think of like the, like the movie Airplane, like the guy who's like, Lloyd Bridges, who's like doing all these serious things, but you're doing them so dry and sarcastically that they are also funny in themselves. I thought of somebody else who was in Blade Runner and Daryl Hannah, who would be perfect for this. And so she's in Splash with Tom Hanks. She has some comedic sensibilities with her. And I, she's a big, imposing lady as well. So I think she would do good at this. So best shot, Ernest. I talked about it a, a little bit before. But uh, that white pan introducing where Ace's apartment was, that, mm-hmm. that for me, that was so memorable. Washington Avenue, uh, that panning, uh, just the cinematic moment of, of setting that up, of, of where your end goal is and starting there and then panning to uh, the main character coming to the apartment. For me, like it was and still is a, a memorable scene. And Chad? When... Ace whistles for all his animals to come out of his apartment, come out of hiding, and they're coming out of everywhere. Uh, 
the refrigerator, as you mentioned, like the trash cans, uh, the raccoons, squirrels, penguins, birds, just all flocking to him. And he's down in this very kind of snow white moment as majestic music is playing in the background and all the animals are coming to him. I think that's a really great shot. I had kind of two, so I'll just read my other one. And yeah, that that is definitely one of them. And the other one, and I didn't ask for this, but it's actually pretty well done. When they first go to the crime scene of the apartment tower, the camera looks up in the air and you see this lens flare and then it zooms out and then you move through the broken glass of the skylight and you see then a little hint of blood on that broken glass and then it looks down and it follows down into the ground and you see a body being zipped up in the bag and this is... And that's pretty good for a comedy and I didn't, you know, I don't, I don't demand that kind of camera work. Good on them for this. I just happen to notice that's a good shot. So, best scene. Ernest. For me... And I, I know we talked about it earlier and the controversy behind it, but the final aha moment of the Pinkle is Einhorn. Yeah. There's a lot of funny stuff going on there. Chad. As a Cowboys fan, I, I think I have to go with Ace Ventura wailing on the Eagles mascot and just the Jumbotron focusing in on uh, Jim as he's beating him up saying, you know, he's an animal lover everywhere, and Courtney Cox is in the background kind of snickering as he's just wailing on the mascot. It's just delightful, and I could watch that over and over. So I'm going to do the dinner party. I love Jim walking around with all these ritzy people and, like, sticking food out of his mouth, shoving, like, uh, this is a really nice moment. He walks by the people in the strings, and, like, he just yanks one of their elbows and off of, like, what they're playing and then it has the iconic scene where he comes out of the bathroom again. Uh, do not go in there. Woo! The Mission Impossible song where he's like hopping over a railing. He has no need to do this. And then he acts like he's on a ledge, like climbing into the door. And I mean, there's no threat of danger here, but it's just so, so funny to watch how he moves around yeah. the shot. So Yeah, you're thinking like, where is he going? And then when you get to when it, the final reveal of where he's actually going, it's like... None of that was necessary. I know. And <laughs> it's probably not a, not a surprise that I might pick my best supporting actor of Udo Kier there uh, because he's in this as well. And this for me is that and the montage are like the moments of like highest density of laughs. And I just, I really enjoy this scene. So Ernest, if you had to change one thing, how, what would it be? There's a lot of over the top moments in this film, but the one that I felt were it could have been a, a jumping the shark moment was when Ace caught the bullet in his teeth. Oh, okay. I like that. Okay. But okay. That's fine. So we're going to not catch a bullet in teeth. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and then Chad, uh, change one thing. The bullet in the teeth is up there, but uh, yeah, I, I th we talked about it earlier. I think I'd dial back some of the Ace reactions just a little bit, maybe take out... Uh, the burning the clothes or the showering and uh, the final everyone throwing up, including Snowflake the dolphin. I think you could still establish your punchline without doing that. Hmm. I, uh, I, I'm with you on everything you said. I might leave the uh, the police department while I, like wiping their mouths because she's been kissing everybody. I think that was the whole implication. That there's no easy way of getting that across other than by showing discomfort on their part. But I am with you on the uh, everything we talked about earlier. So... Best quote, and there is a lot of really good ones in this one. Ernest, do you have a best quote? All righty then. That's a great, yeah. That's a good, uh, Chad. Going back to sweet Mrs. Finkel. Ray would have never missed that kick. <laughs> Dan Marino should die of gonorrhea and rotten hell. <laughs> oh, you're not going to finish it with, would you like a cookie, son? <laughs> yeah. Just, just uh, any of those. You could stop stop with any of those just she's great one that i actually use if i actually get a good parking spot and like i have to work at it to get it in there uh and maybe even park too close so i have a friend at work sean Rand, who's like you park too close to this person i'm like well i got it so too bad for them and uh so i uh i frequently find myself saying like a glove <laughs> very nice Got to call out a couple of uh, honorable mentions, though. Uh, obviously, you got your Lee there. If I'm not back in five minutes, wait longer. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait longer. And uh, 
I also like the, uh, I'm looking for Ray Finkel and a fresh pair of pants. <laughs> I also love the landlord when he comes up behind Ace and he's like, Ventura. He's like, yes, Satan. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were somebody else. Just, landlord was good. There were just so many good lines. And this is just like we said, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Ernest, is there anything you want to plug? Of the thousand and one things I could plug. I, I can't um, forget to, to mention that one of my closest childhood friends that I would always go to the film, the movies with, who I may have saw this with, is actually an actor uh, present day, Ross Enoch McCurdy, uh, recently on the CBS show FBI. Wow. He, yeah, he has a few roles here and there, one-off roles, but um, uh, this year may be a big year for him uh, on the big screen. So look out, world, for Ross Enoch McCurdy. That's a fun plug. Now it's time for everyone to give their five-star rating and uh, review here. So, uh, Ernest, uh, five-star scale, what do you give Ace Ventura Pet Detective? Solid four. Solid four. And Chad? I'm going to go three and a half. Ooh, that's a, that's a little low for me. I'm, I'm going to match Ernest and go sp- uh, a four. I was thinking 4.5 at one point with my enjoyment, but upon watching it a second time, the back third of the movie does get a little bit choppy. And like the mystery suffers a little bit there. And I, you know, there is a little bit of regret of some of the things we talked about. Um, but it's about as enjoyable as a four star movie can be because I laugh a lot in this movie. So it's on the borderline of, of a 4.5. But I'm sticking four. Chad, you want to help me pick a movie for next time? Absolutely. Bring it on. So next time, we're going to do a different kind of comedy. We're going to do a dramedy, which is probably not really a comedy at all. It's a drama that has comedic elements in it. So uh, from one side of the spectrum to the other, uh, we're going to do a dramedy. Are you ready for three options? I'm ready. Option one, The Royal Tenenbaums from 2001. An eccentric members of a dysfunctional family reluctantly gather under the same roof for various reasons. Option two. Good Morning Vietnam from 1987. In 1965, an unorthodox, irreverent DJ named Adrian Cronover uh, begins to shake things up when he is assigned to the U.S. Army Services radio station in Vietnam. Option three, Life is Beautiful from 1997. When an open-minded Jewish librarian and his son become victims of the Holocaust, he uses a perfect mixture of will, humor, imagination to protect his son from the dangers around them in the camp. All good movies... I haven't seen Life is Beautiful, but I'm going to have to go with Royal Tenenbaums. Wes Anderson time. The Royal Tenenbaums it is, so watch the Royal Tenenbaums and tune in next time. And to all of you out there, thank you so much for listening. Like us on Facebook. Write to us on RetroMovieRoundTable at Yahoo.com if you would want to be on the show, if you have more comments for the show. Uh, please go to iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Like the show, rate it, subscribe. Your ratings help us come up in searches and other people find the show that way. That's why we ask every week. It is a huge help. It's the biggest thing you can do to help the show. So I was talking about helping out the show. Ernest, thank you so much for being a great guest. Wearing his Miami Dolphins hat and, and uh, sharing your love of Miami and this movie with us. Yes, thank you. If there's one last thing I, I, I can ask, yeah. it'd be great if I could go out on Welcome to Miami. <laughs>